Okay, now we're going to look a little bit more closely at two of the tales from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Um, this is just to give you a taste, and of course your reading will allow for much more depth. Um, but let's begin with the Miller's prologue and tale. So the Miller's tale is far more interesting than his prologue, which is quite the opposite with the, the Wife of Baths. Um, but looking at the Miller's Tale, it's a fablio. This is a short, humorous narrative that was popular in France starting in the 13th century. You know, typically it's just a bawdy tale, um, but it's characterized by greater realism. So there's no magical characters and events like there may have been in L'Anval. Um, it's set in the here and now, not like long ago and far away when there were fairies and fairy queens. Um, it's common people rather than nobles. Again, uh, Lanval and tales of that nature were generally focused on the nobility. Um, and its earthiness is what marks it as particularly distinct. It's very uh, body, as I said. Um, it's got coarse language. Um, so Fablio, the, as a genre, tend to flout authority um, there's a sort of common theme of gleeful adultery um, and where a repressed wife and often a clever cleric like we have in the Miller's Tale um, uh, get away with uh, all kinds of uh, hijinks. And in the Miller's Tale uh, it really serves as an answer or reply to the Knight's Tale which precedes it. So um, Again, just an emphasis, this is a tale of comic relief. We've just had a high, noble tale by the knight. Uh, it's a cla his was a classical romance all about courtly love and, and characters of high status. Um, the miller is a drunk. He wants to tell his tale, and actually uh, Bailey tries to stop him, but he no, no, I'm going to tell my tale. It's a, you know, it's a good response to the knight's tale. Um, and it's, again all hijinks and laughter. So um, we get some sense of the characters here though. So from the very beginning we get a sense of the deception that's to come because really it's the Miller's, sorry not the Miller's wife, the um, carpenter's wife of this tale who um, sets all the trouble in order. Here's a description. Fair was this young wife and therewithal as any weasel her body gent and small. So it's just right off the bat, we think of his choice of a word like weasel, which has a similar meaning today. Um, yes, it's a creature that is gent and small or graceful and slender, but it also has all these char char connotations that we know today. Um, if you call someone a weasel, they're generally sly and they're going to uh, try to deceive you. So th th then it continues uh, with a description of the fair young wife and sickerly she had a licorous eye, or lecherous. Full small pull, pulled were her brows too, and though were bent and black as slew. Uh, slow or slew is a, a hedgerow, a, a berry in the hedgerows in England. It's bitter to the taste, but it's very velvety. So the statement that she had a lecherous eye is followed by an observation of the care she takes to make her eyes or eyebrows thin and appealing. And so you already get a sense of, from this of something that's very actually contemporary. We know women like this today who sort of capitalize on their beauty in order to get things that they desire. Uh, in this case, she desires something a bit more than her older carpenter husband. Uh, again, this is a parody of a courtly romance. So um, Chaucer's setting up to entertain us with the tale, but also to comment on human nature, class, and gender. Um, and in this case, he's focusing on the common class and um, you know, poking fun at them, but it amusing us all along. So was, there's some questions I'm going to ask you to think about and actually answer on the discussion board, but let me just foreground them. One, I'd like you to think about um, his claim that he's simply uh, repeating what he heard on pilgrimage, but we know that the entire pilgrimage was... Um, a fictional construction. So what is uh, Chaucer suggesting as the truth that he's bound to? How does this fit in with his sundry folk, his uh, common people that he's portraying for us, that he's trying to be true to their voice? And ultimately, you know, we will see this throughout British literature, a sort of truth to the people. 
So that's just one thing I'd like you to think about. Another, you could think about the description of Allison. Allison, by the way, is just a, um, a Middle Ages term for wife. But what type of imagery is used to describe her? I, I read a little bit there. And does Chaucer seem sympathetic to her, her unhappiness with a husband? Because again, her husband is much older than her. But mm, I'm curious uh, to hear you all think about whether Chaucer is sympathetic or agnostic on that issue. Other questions are, um, to what degree you think this is a satire of the conventions of courtly love? Remember that Alison in the tale prefers the lusty cleric over the attentions of Absalom. Um, and, you know, Absalom is the more of the courtly character. So you, know, you could explore that. You might think about um, uh, the way the cleric gets the better of the carpenter um, and whether or not um, Chaucer's commenting on his cleverness, his, his book learning. Uh, and um, maybe it's Absalom in the end, in the way that he gets his revenge, who is uh, the most clever. Or you could simply, you know, stand back and ask who or what is being criticized in this tale. So there's a lot to think about here, and I look forward to talking with you or writing with you uh, on the discussion board. Let's move on to the Wife of Bath's uh, prologue and tale. So her prologue is the longest, and it really it's the most interesting. Um, her tale is pretty brief, though it's equally important. Um, it, it is in some ways most important because it follows uh, her prologue, which tells us a lot about her. She's a wealthy businesswoman, and she survived five husbands. Um, so it's important to take away from this that um, she's clever. She's smart. This is a woman who um, has been successful in her own business, um, um, bringing the denim business to um, Bath in a time when very few women were capitalists, and not to mention successful in men's world. Um, and she demonstrates her sort of success and wealth uh, by, say, tra traveling on pilgrimages, not just this one to Canterbury, but she notes that she's been to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem three times. So she clearly has wits. Um, and her prologue reveals the tough lessons that she's learned in life. And this is just a quote from the very beginning. Experience, though nun octorite were in this world, is right enough for me to speak of woe that is in marriage. So she's saying, you know, experience, though it's not given much um, credibility in this world that values um, book learning and that sort of thing. It's good enough for me because I've learned a, a, a lot in five marriages. And she goes on to tell us she was married first at the age of 12. So clearly she has had a great deal of experience. One of her husbands um, beat her so brutally that she's deaf in one ear. So again, experience is, has indeed been a good lesson or a good uh, teacher for her. Um, her main theme is maestry. And this is a, a Middle English word that roughly translates into mastery or dominance. Um, and she asks in her tale, why should it be that men are lord in marriage or master of the house? And in this way, both her prologue and her tale are sort of proto-feminist in voice. They're challenging the gendered balance of the home. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, everything she stands for is radically feminist. I'm just saying she's asking important questions at the beginning of British literature about the gender balances we have. So true to this theme, she uses her prologue to challenge the company she's, she's with. And so she speaks to the men and provokes quite a reaction, you'll notice when you read it. Um, the Wife of Bath's Tale is an, ro Arthur sorry, it's a, an Arthurian romance in a style called the Loathly Lady Tale. So this, this, has, this is a genre. And typical of this genre are the motif of the fairy bride and the inversion of gender roles. And so you're going to see this when you, hopefully you'll watch the video from YouTube of the animated version of this. It's, it's I think, very well done. Um, but even in reading it, you'll you'll notice the role that uh, a fairy bride plays and the inversion of gender roles. But it's a tale about rape and the violence which men do to women, so it's further comment on her prologue. So again, um, once you've taken a look at this, I'm going to ask you to do, go to the discussion board and consider some questions, and so I'll just walk you through them here quickly. Um, one is, do you think the prologue, um, the, the, the Wife of Bath prologue, belongs in Jenkins' Book of Wicked Wives? 
or do you think it it, it effect, effectively tears the anti-feminist <laughs> tradition apart? Because that's certainly what her husband Jen Jenkins was, an anti-feminist, as was his book of Wicked Wives. Um, so think about that, or think about um, how the wife manipulates argument and textual authority. So is she justified in manipulating texts and arguments as she does? And you would, of course, need to give us some evidence and analyze that. Or consider, does the wife expose power relations that are inevitable in marriage? Because I think we've really moved outside of courtly romance here and into the realm of the everyday, workaday world of marriage. And, or you might consider um, if the wife is capable of imagining any alternative to the ex exercise of absolute power by either the husband or the wife in marriage. I don't know that her tale offers us a middle ground. Either one has a power or the other. Do you see something more subtle in the work? Or you could consider if the prologue is simply one woman's history, um, or if it's a comment on literary tradition that's d determined by structures of power, which I, I'll just tell you, I lean towards the latter. I don't think it's just about one one woman. I think we see this happen again and again. We see it in Shakespeare. We see it in uh, Wollstonecraft and, and other authors we'll read later. So these are some things for us to think about and talk about on the discussion board. Thanks for listening.